So my, my first engagement in the philanthropic sector um, was when I returned from, from London and I, having a conversation about patterns of immigration to Australia and one of my aunts who was, had been involved with, a, uh, uh, with an organisation uh, providing um, uh, uh, advice um, around uh, uh, migration said, well, if you're interested in that, you should really get involved. Um, so as a, a relatively young person, um, maybe some might say I didn't step backwards quickly enough, um, but I found myself serving on the board of a small community organisation uh, that was working with um, um, uh, cross-country migration and the sorts of social issues that arise as a consequence of that. And that was uh, a role that I was playing in the community sector at the same time that I was working for Citibank. Um, and it, to my great astonishment in a way, I found that um, um, one role was a perfect complement to the mm -hmm. other. Uh, the interesting thing about, about that was the, the community organisation was actually set up as a public company limited by guarantee. Um, with the requirement of uh, annual general meetings, all of the governance mm -hmm. arrangements, audit, um, meetings to chair, uh, interactions with private sector support, state government, federal government, local government. There was an opportunity around professional development that if I hadn't done something like that probably wouldn't have happened to me in any other role for, for maybe a decade. Yeah, that's uh, right. So it fast forwarded a whole lot of things. So that actually that was the question I was going to ask because I think a number of us here are actually also business in business or business owners um, in a sense too and, and there's there's a there's a linkage you know between between how one operates in a sense in, 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 in business and how that influences perhaps you know um, the way that we might approach our engagement in um, you know philanthropy too because I think phila philanthropy clearly you know you know you talk about the myths and legends in your family that the, the the stories that make you proud to be who you are you know as a member of your family and the, and the good human being you know mm. uh, ness um, of, of that and, and how important that is but I think as, as, as and that that frames the background of it but as, as each of us as, as individuals and you know and, and you know you come from a sort of business a business family you know a business a business perspective too um, you know what are the ways and what are the other ways in a sense in which you know your 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 business um, perspective you know the the objectives of business the the networks of business the skills of business you know how, how has that also really um, come to bear in helping you to do yeah. to be a more effective <coughs> philanthropist it, it it's a really interesting question that the the statement that I like um, the most particularly in relation to the arts is that um, the arts should be business-like, but not like business. Mm. Um, and I, I think that's quite a sort of a, an interesting sort of way in to think about um, what the role and responsibility is of someone with a business background in serving, in serving the arts sector. Mm. Um, and so what do I mean by that? There is this sense of sort of community and cultural capital that I think is very relevant to the, uh, to the role that arts organisations mm. play. Um, if they're not business-like, they will go out of business. <coughs> yeah. um, uh, and I think uh, in contemporary governance and uh, particularly in, in the relationships that different arts organisations have with, with government, with their multiple stakeholders, with benefactors in particular, yeah. um, there is a, a trust relationship and an expectation um, that there'll be good governance practices, that there'll be um, very good sort of financial record keeping, um, that all of the things that you would expect in a well-governed organisation will exist uh, and that the arts are not let off, let off the hook because they're the arts and they're special. Um, uh, that's not the case at all. There's a there's a real um, need for um, those business skills to apply. Um, the observation that I make you know, quite often is that when business people become involved with the with the arts, they're so enthralled with uh, with being in that artistic space um, that very often they they forget that they're there for a purpose, mm. which is to share uh, some of the skills that they that they're bringing from from other roles. So, you know, my encouragement to anyone uh, is don't don't become so subsumed by the by the culture of an arts organisation that you you check in your talent and your skill mm. at the door mm. uh, and feel that somehow you're going to be in conflict with uh, with the, the people around the table. In fact, you're you're liberating um, the organisation by by bringing that that discipline. Um, and I think that's a, that's a really important um, 
elements. Maybe tell us a little bit about that too, because I think arts always has that that um, you know perception that oh well that's the nice to have once everything else is sort of sorted out, right? You know, so I mean when you're trying to put you know those those you know the case forward to 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 other people to be to, to rally to engage to to advocate you know for this too. What are the things that you that you highlight or, 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 or talk about, um, I mean, maybe to different kinds of groups, because different people will have different uh, motivations, clearly, you know, but what are the kinds of uh, uh, messages or, 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 or um, you know, the rationale, in a sense, the case for, um, you know, the yeah. arts, when you reach out to, to, to other people? Look, the, the, the go-to line that I, that I think about um, very often is, is the one that's attributed to Winston Churchill during the the Second World War that some of you may be familiar with when asked why the, why the government uh, didn't cut the budget for the arts mm. during the war effort. Uh, and he is uh, alleged to have said, w um, well, if we did, what are we fighting for? Mm. Uh, and it's a, it's, a really, it's a really interesting um, mm. remark and a really interesting sentiment that um, you know, in it, I think, reflects a view that there is a centrality um, around the importance and significance of cultural life within a community uh, and that mm. it is responsible for the way in which we communicate with each other, we share our nation's stories, we um, treasure uh, the nation's objects, we are in conversation with ourselves around what is significant and important to us as a people and the way in which we wish to represent ourselves as a, uh, as a sovereign place and as a sovereign people to the other nations of the world. Mm. Um, and I, I think there's a real elegance in, 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 that, in that single line that um, you know, must have been said with great conviction you know, at, a very, at a very difficult time. And if it could be said by him then, yeah. <laughs> then, then in a sense, you know, I'd say, well, where are all the inheritors of that peace um, and, um, and what came from that? And that there's almost a duty and obligation to to continue with a sentiment like that and the yeah. way that we express ourselves about yeah. the importance and centrality of culture within our own within our own communities and our own countries. Picking that up, I think one of the things that that, that um, you know we do know keeps people in the game is beyond beyond the sense of, of purpose that one personally has is kind of the shared sense of purpose, right? I mean the the relationships one has with with like-minded people that you know you know that together you can achieve and, and impact, you know, so so much more. So really really think about those friendships I think as, as you as you point out I mean those are those are folks you would go have dinner with hang out with go on literally on yep. vacation or these missions you know um, uh, with too which I think is, is tremendous well, I think also from the point of view of, a, of, of the institution um, the most extraordinary thing happens a group forms yeah. um, and they form around they coalesce around an idea and a place and the leadership being given by the curators and, and the directors and um, you know it's um, it's this thing called fun yeah. um, and um, you know that leads to other opportunities and other other ways of engaging with that institution the, the term belonging is one that I that I use quite a lot because I think it, it is actually a, a really significant expression to use within the context of the arts in particular um, and I think I sort mm. of described the sense of just walking into this building and seeing in the name spaces and the way in which the community is engaged in the life of this of this institution and from what I've seen in other galleries that that you do if you're a benefactor if you're involved in some way you walk in and you think actually this is this is my place um, mm. um, and I can bring other other people here and share the experience and that um, and that that sense of, of belonging. Yeah. So it's about both bringing people in as well as taking the message of kind of the who we are out. You know, we often find ourselves having to explain in in Australia, you know, why is it that a that a cultural institution or benefactors would support something that is so far away, and that may not immediately be on the horizon of the 24 million Australians who who live down the road here. Um, mm. uh, and of course, the real answer is because you need to have. Um, an international presence uh, and there are only so many signature events uh, in each arts discipline where, where that opportunity exists and that happens to be one of them for the, for the visual arts. Singapore is not a state duty so when you give a gift to the arts you are not incentivized. Um, so is there something we can do to give a credit to offset something else? Mm. Yeah? Mm. How do you incentivize people 
to give to a space that is vital, that's important, but yet not top of mind right mm. now. And then I'm very curious, mm. um, sir, how you actually have that discussion with your next generations about the art space. Mm. Yeah, how do you how do you involve them? Because I've talked to many many clients about how they do that for other spaces, yeah. but arts, mm, you know, children think of it as they're just drawing, drawing. How do you how do you bring that interest and keep that alive? to the time when it's time for them mm. to make the, okay. the big giving decision. So, yeah. so two questions then. One around you know, the, <laughs> ROI, the ROI of <laughs> arts. So yeah. how, do you, how do you measure effectiveness of arts on one hand? And the yeah. other, the other like thinking about how do you communicate that to future generations? Yeah. Look, l l let me tackle the, the second of those first. Um, um, and that is you know, how do you sort of transmit um, to another generation mm. uh, the significance and importance of the arts? And I think you know, the way that I would project it is that, you know, when, when family members are traveling and they're mm. asked where they're from, you know, the first thing they're going to say is they're from Singapore. So what does that mean? You know, what, what does that mean to the person mm. who's hearing that? And what do you want it to mean? Um, you know, what, what do you want the mm. answer to that question to be? Um, and how do, you, how do you want people to respond and react to that, to that question? So, um, you know, for my case, um, you know, when my children are traveling and they're, they're asked where they're from and the answer is Australia, um, people will have a, a view about, about Australia. And, and sometimes it's, a, it's extraordinary and sometimes it's, um, it's, um, uh, it's some stereo, stereotype. Um, but what would they want it to be? Yeah. Well, I suspect what they'd really want it to be, they'd, what, what they'd want people to think, is that, the, is that the nation where they're from or the city um, is is culturally ambitious, is culturally relevant, but, but has strong cultural values. Um, it's a place that, that really matters, that it's, um, um, it's at the center of, uh, of, some, of something that's important beyond, beyond business and beyond having great hospitals mm -hmm. and beyond having great public facilities. Um, so I, I'd sort of project that into the, into the next generation, that the conversation you'd be having with your children is, you know, what is it that we might all do together to ensure that when the question is answered, Singapore, that uh, what is it we'd like that to mean? Mm. How would we like that to resonate um, in other parts of the world? And how do we actually want to, to have that sense of belief here ourselves, yeah. for y yourselves? The question about measuring cultural value um, is, a, is, a really, is a really interesting one. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I mean, invariably, you know, you can have pages and pages and books and books on statistics and um, GDP measures and um, measures now of happiness and a whole whole range of um, of other things, but but it is very difficult to get to the to get to the nub of uh, of, um, of of impact. Um, um, having having said that, there are lots of ways that you can sort of go around it, including measures of participation in the arts, um, uh, uh, measures of audience um, growth, a whole range of um, instrumentalist benefits that can be measured, the economic impact of, mm. uh, um, of arts organizations, the um, uh, education um, outcomes, health outcomes. Mm. Um, I mean, all of these now have a, have a measurement factor uh, attaching to them and, ca and can be collated and, uh, and talked about. But I guess my question is, that there's a lot they can give money and, and ha help something, mm. but how do you make that sustainable? Right, so, so can they help something, create something that is going to help in the art scene, but it's got to generate enough revenue eventually so that it's self-sustaining, so that they don't have to keep pumping in money, yeah. pumping in money, I, pumping I, in money. I, I I don't you know, that's, yeah. that's the sort of thinking that a lot of entrepreneurs have, right? Yeah. Whether to make it sustainable, I think it must come from the heart too. It also must come from our own pocket. If you always rely on somebody to make it sustainable, I don't think that's possible. I think what you've been speaking about is actually more in line with the concept of venture philanthropy, mm. yeah. where people actually want to get I'm involved on a grassroots economic. level, and they're almost coming in it with an investor's mindset. Yeah. And, and it is absolutely possible for them, if they invest their money in the right way, to be a part of that business structure. And as you talked about earlier as well, actually bringing other skill sets to the mm. table. So business planning, strategy planning, can they do your financial auditing and those sorts of things. So actually in a way, those families can engage their children with their charitable activities, whether it's arts or more broadly, 
that allow them to use other skills and to develop other skills that will be a benefit to them in their education and going forward. And if it is planned well with the charity, then actually they can be investing in such a way that they are ensuring that capacity building and that development and the sustainability of that organisation going forward so they can see it grow and grow and grow and know that they're involved right from the start. There is a headline view that, uh, that sponsorship is the deal and philanthropy is the gift. Mm. Um, and um, it's, it's actually worth sort of thinking about that in terms of what the motivation is um, of, uh, that, that stands behind mm. the, the act that is about to be performed. Um, and um, if it is transactional in the way that you're, uh, that you're talking about, I think transaction is only going to get you so far along the philanthropic journey. Yeah. Philanthropy is a lot about relationships yeah. and in particular, and in particular long-term relationships. The most extraordinary conversations that I find myself ever having are someone who I've never tapped before, met before tapping me on the, on the shoulder somewhere and saying, you won't know this, comma, um, uh, and invariably I won't know it, and they'll tell me a story about a relatively <coughs> modest, um, um, uh, some modest financial support that was provided to some organisation or some individual 20 years ago. Mm. And they'll say, you don't know, you won't know this, but, and then they'll go through the story about what that grant meant at that time and what that led to and what that led to yeah. and what the consequence was of that very small grant all those years ago. Now there is actually no way of measuring that. Yeah. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm terribly <coughs> sorry for everyone who's looking for you know, sustainability and very specific outcomes and for the, for the philanthropists who are really keen to know exactly what ROI is and, you know, and, and, and if, that's what, if that's what turns them on, you know, they're not going to get excited by the prospect of a 20 or 30 year yeah. longitudinal impact. But One way to think about this when you're talking to your, um, your clients, each or the, 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 the families, is this notion of value proposition. You know, what is the value proposition that this organisation that is requesting support is, is central to their mission? And, and whether that is aligned, I guess, to the kinds of values and, and the requirements and the interests of the families that are giving. Because in a way, as you know, Rupert has said quite clearly, there's such a vast range of charitable arts organisations, mm. some of which it's terribly difficult to get a sense of a sustainable um, yep. you know, yep. business because you are essentially dealing with disadvantaged members of the population. There are other arts organisations, though, that perhaps are doing really innovative things. And the Music Ensemble, whose board I sit on, for example, is one example of this, where it's a group of young Singaporean music Musicians each individually have of had an extraordinarily extraordinary success and won numerous awards, and they're experimenting with traditional Asian instruments and pulling it together with original works and, and new works to create what is we hope to be a kind of authentic Singaporean sound. Yes. Now that is a very risky proposition, but they are a group of people who are very entrepreneurial in their thinking. They have gone out to a range of potential benefactors and they've offered roles in that organisation for those benefactors. So those benefactors can actually be part of the building of that value proposition, yeah. right? It's a very important um, thing, I think, because they can influence what is happening, you know. And this organisation is also very responsible. They have a very strong community outreach program. They have a very strong education component. That is what I mean. I mean, that's an organisation that's very clear about what they're doing very risky, very new, um, very creative, but they're actually being smart and they're having the governance, this is where it comes right. down to this notion of, of people sitting at a board level who are going to bring that kind of disciplined, disciplined. financial thinking and governance to the, the, the behaviour and the outcomes of the organisation. So that, that may be you know, one way to look at it. You look at the central value proposition of the company and how the relationship works between the benefactor and that company itself. If I could just add on that, having come from a double background, I'm an ex-banker as well, like yourself, madam, I think there, and I run an <laughs> art gallery now. The word of return on investment as the, as the starting point of a conversation like that is, tells you that they're not really philanthropists. Because if they were, that wouldn't be the first word they use. Within the context of what I do, we, we probably donate, well, rather, sorry, not the gallery, but over half a million dollars a year of purchases from my gallery are immediately donated by 
collectors from Australia, predominantly from Australia, back to institutions in Australia. We have a show on at the moment where everything has been purchased by private collectors with the ultimate aim of being donated to several state museums in Australia. What they're trying to achieve is legacy, which I think is pretty much what Mr Myers is doing mm. by having that name out there for another 200, 300 years. The return on equity or return on investment is about leaving something for the next generation. If they don't understand that, then they don't want to donate. But it's almost what language do you want mm. for, for which part of the argument. Mm, but right. um, um, but uh, w w one of the comments you just made reminded me that um, you know, Lord Devine, who was the great uh, art dealer, uh, who, who sold uh, to, um, uh, to the Americans, um, you know, Morgan and Frick and Rockefeller and Huntington and uh, um, all of the, um, the major works in their collection, um, towards the end of his life went, went to each of his collectors and, and said in effect, look, I can do one more thing for you. Um, I can give you immortality. Uh, and this is what you have to do. You have to gift your works to a public institution. Mm -hmm. I was sharing with Melissa um, earlier about an experience that I had a couple of years ago in, um, in Chile mm. <coughs> and um, you know, I was speaking uh, to a group of, um, of very wealthy people in Valparaiso which is uh, one of the port towns um, south of Santiago and um, um, I was asked the question, you know, surely, surely philanthropy is a, is a type of self-aggrandizement um, and um, you know, th that's that's something that we, we wouldn't want to be seen to be, yeah. uh, to be um, self-aggrandizing um, amongst our friends and, and within, a, within a community. You know, my mother would have said, never talk about what you're doing philanthropically. You know, no one ever talks about it. You just do it very quietly and, uh, uh, and kind of sort of hope no one notices. Um, um, my, my father's family, I suppose, started out that way. Uh, and maybe in the last couple of decades has taken the view that it's like anything that requires leadership um, and the more you actually talk about it and celebrate it um, and, and honour the fact that there are people in the community who are prepared to, uh, to support um, different organisations across different fields of human endeavour then the more that's likely to encourage and support other acts um, and so therefore a sort of a culture of philanthropy mm. becomes a broader based um, uh, concept and and it's not actually about massive dollops of wealth either it's it's about bringing everyone in the community yeah, on that right. journey um, right. uh, it's about um, um, you know, volunteerism it's about spending time in the community it's about engaging and giving of yourself um, being other regarding in addition to being self-regarding yeah. which is you know an, an Adam Smith type type concept and certainly my foundation they have been around for such a long time and I would say I'm at the embryonic stage as mm -hmm. such, right? Uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of being a large renowned uh, foundation? Does it uh, create a complacency that, that you know, money is just going to come and they don't work for it? Because uh, mm. I like to help out only when you know, they can't do anything else. So I like to top up. That's what I do. I, I, I tend to top yeah. up rather than, than, than t uh, giving them money straight and then you know, they're happy. Yeah. Mm. I want them to work a bit more for it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's my question. In my experience, the philanthropic sector is, is extraordinary, extraordinarily collaborative. Mm. Um, and it's one of the few sectors where I suppose there is some element of competition around, you know, you're always wanting to support the the best projects and the ones with the greatest leverage and, and so forth and so on. But, but actually, um, more often than not, you're very happy to share that project with others in the model of a, of a coalition of the, um, of, of, of the willing. Mm. Um, I guess in the case of a, of a foundation where there is a corpus um, uh, and the corpus is producing income, um, uh, it, it actually exists to make grants. Um, uh, and I, I often make the distinction between you know, what I'm doing when I'm sitting as a board member of the Maya Foundation um, and what I'm doing when I'm sitting around my own kitchen table. Um, in the Maya Foundation case, I'm actually helping to administer someone else's philanthropic act um, because the corpus that exists you know, arose as a consequence of the philanthropic act of my father and uncle when I'm sitting around the kitchen table, that's actually, that's, that's coming out of my, my pocket. Mm. 
So in one instance I'm administering and in the other uh, case it's a first person singular act of philanthropy and I'm the philanthropist. How you come upon different projects and, and how you respond d depends in part around the guidelines that you promote, the public visibility that, uh, that a foundation has. So, you know, the Sydney Maya Fund and Maya Foundation produce an annual report. There, there's a website, there's financial information, there are guidelines, there's a, there's a whole process. Um, nobody knows the name of my foundation. Um, uh, and it's not, it's not because, it's not because I, I don't want them to. It's just that it's something that's actually very personal mm. to my wife and to me and to our children. Um, and um, you know, we tend to support those organizations and activities that we're directly involved with. Um, so there's a sort of a layering effect um, between what you might do very much first person singular, what you might do within a branch of a family, what you might do yeah, in a multi-generational yeah. uh, family context, and, and, and then there's what you might do as a business.